morning. Welcome to Watkins United Methodist Church and happy Memorial Day to everyone. I pray that you are safe and that your family members are well. And uh, I pray that during this Memorial Day holiday weekend that you and your family will draw closer together and enjoy time together. Um, this, this morning, this morning I would like to uh, begin with some prayer requests. And uh, those prayer requests um, are very numerous, as a matter of fact. Um, there are a couple of praises, and I would like to lift those praises up to you. Uh, Yvonne Brown did have a successful surgery this past week, and she is so relieved to not have the pain that she had for the first time in many, many months. So praise God for that. And Cheryl Satterley's dad, they had a visit with him for the first time since the pandemic. And believe me, uh, they were very relieved to find out that he is uh, better, uh, doing better than they even thought that he might be. So I thank God for that and their time that they got to share the visit. Uh, our preschool director, Natalina Grisber's husband, Rick's father, Mickey, and mother, Joyce, unfortunately, have been diagnosed with COVID-19. So please keep uh, Director uh, Natalina Grisber and her family in your prayers. Uh, also, Lorraine Cottle's son-in-law, Heath Lewis, uh, has been diagnosed with COVID, and she's very worried about her daughter and her granddaughter. So please remember uh, Heath Lewis and Lorene and their family. Um, also, uh, unfortunately, too, one of our preschool teachers, Tanya Caballero, uh, has been diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, she is better, but uh, she has been diagnosed with that. Uh, uh, unfortunately. So please keep her in your prayers. I know she's, if you know her at all, you know she's very bubbly and she's a, an awesome lady. And we're so thankful to have her in our preschool. Um, also remember Megan Romero's father, Charles Parton, uh, who uh, has been moved to a larger hospital and they plan to keep him for at least two weeks, according to Megan. Also, Megan has reported, unfortunately, Leo, her son, is having some new types of seizures. And this week, um, it looks like they're going to be going into the neurologists to run some more tests. So please remember little Leo in your prayers. And then uh, please remember the transition between Pastor Rob and I and Pastor Rob's family and Molly and Cliff, their dog, and Patsy and I. So uh, with having said that, uh, let's continue now with the spirit of worship. And uh, Martha, I believe, is going to come and sing. And Ellen is here today to play. And Steve is here, and so is Megan. And um, just had a lot of people this past week. I, I had a little time with Lunch Bunch on a Zoom. And uh, they talked a lot about uh, how the quality of our services really improved. So they were thanking uh, Megan and Steve and everyone concerned. All right. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. If you have a Methodist hymnal, we are singing We Gather Together, and it is number 131.
let's have time together. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones do him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Christ is first. 
And this scripture that I have selected uh, this morning through the Lord is Colossians 1, 17 through 18. Colossians is all about the supremacy of Christ. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. You know, during this Memorial Day weekend, one of the things that we think about is sacrifice. And um, I am reminded of a story that I heard during World War II of two uh, sides, the Allied side and the Germans, who were fighting in a war uh, on a specific night. And between the two uh, armies, there was this huge uh, ditch full of barbed wire. And one of the German soldiers, for whatever reason, got shot and fell into the barbed wire. And one of the Allied soldiers, after hearing this man uh, languish in agony and cry out for help, finally took it upon himself, not knowing whether he would be shot or not, but got up, stood up, went to the man, and picked him up and cut the barbed wire from him, and the Allied and the German soldiers stopped. And as he was holding this German soldier, he stepped over to the German's side. And when he did that, a German officer stepped forward. And the German officer stepped up, saluted him, and before he took the man, he took off a distinguished purple heart and gave it put it on the soldier's out uniform and then took the man and left. And nothing happened to that American soldier until, and, and, you know, he got back. He was safe. Nothing happened at all. You know, it's that kind of courage and sacrifice that has made our country great. And it happens every day. And today, we don't just lift up our Memorial Day, you know, uh, thinking of those who have gone before us and, and have, uh, you know, died in service, but also, this is also a day uh, on Sunday where we remember what Jesus did for us. And the reason that soldier stepped forward was because he knew that it was the right thing to do even if he had to risk his life, he knew it was what God would want him to do. There is a sacrifice. Now, you know, during this pandemic, we're all walking through some things. Uh, and sometimes it's dark, like it was for that poor man who was caught in the barbed wire. But then there's Jesus who will come into our lives. And when he does, the light turns on and everything changes now, in this particular story, Mary and Martha, uh, Jesus had a very close relationship with them and her, their brother Lazarus, and he loved them, the Bible says, and when they knew that Lazarus was really sick, they sent a note to him. Now, how do I know this? Is because this note, back in those days, you didn't have email, okay? And for those of you who are on uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams, which Judy has helped me really understand a lot, this, there's a, a, an app called OneNote where you can put all your notes on it. Well, they didn't have OneNote, okay? Um, but let me ask you a question. They, they had it to send Jesus a note and they did it by runners. And they wanted to get Jesus' attention because they wanted him to come. They wanted God to come and save their brother. Now, I want to ask you, 
If you had someone in your family that was very sick, and you wanted God to do it, and you had the opportunity to write a note to God, what would you say? Well, let's look and see what Mary and Martha wrote to Jesus. It's here, it says in verse 3 of chapter 11, Lord, behold, the one you love is sick. Now, I want you to listen to that. It's very important. That's just like the whole sermon in a nutshell right there. Lord, Lazarus loves you, so therefore come. No, it didn't say that. It says, Lord, behold, the one you love is sick. You see, they weren't pointing to themselves. They weren't pointing to what they did, they were pointing to what Jesus did in their lives. And, you know, when we think of this invitation to be second, it's because we're following Jesus who is first. And so there's an offering from Jesus to follow him. Well, if there's an offering to follow him, you've got to follow, right? You can't be first if you're following him. So I want you to think about that for a minute in your life. You know, he, he offers us an invitation that is second to none. It is the most important invitation that any of us could ever have, and that is to follow Jesus. So what does that really mean, this invitation to be second? Well, first of all, it means that it's, it's about the love of God, not as much about the love that we have. Now, this invitation to be second in following Jesus we start out in John eleven three, 3, saying what the note said, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, I don't know if you realize this or not, but a week before Jesus was put on the cross, he spent that whole week with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus at their house. Now, here is the, the God of the universe. And he's coming to your house and he says, I'm going to spend a week with you. I don't know about you, but I would imagine that would be a pretty spectacular and special time. If Jesus wanted to come and spend a week with you. Especially right before he knew Holy Week was going to come all the events of the crucifixion and the resurrection. He knew what he was going to have to go through. You know what I have found? I have found like Mary and Martha, the people in the New Testament who were very close to Jesus did not point to themselves about their love for him. It wasn't about their love. It was about his love for them that made the difference. Can I get an amen? It's not you, you, it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, it's not about us, it's about him. It's not about us, it's not about our love, it's about his love and how much he loves us. Lee Strobel, who wrote the book Case for Christ, he, uh, in his book, talks about, you know, he was the Chicago Tribune journalist who was an atheist, and he tried to prove that God didn't exist, and guess what happened? He became a Christian. He's written many books, and one of those was The Case for Christ. He has been a speaker, a guest speaker. He's a pastor. Listen to what he has to say about this. And about his life 
this whole idea of us being too preoccupied with ourselves and not Jesus. How much of my life following Jesus have I made it about my performance? You think about this. About my deeds, about my goodness and my love. How much of my life following Jesus have I made it about me? Made it about improving my love, improving my performance, improving my deeds, proving my spiritual resume, so to speak. Yet Mary and Martha, in the heat of the moment, when the stakes are the highest, higher than you could ever imagine, their little brother's life hangs in a balance. What seems to surface in their hearts is God's love for Lazarus. Could it be that this book, the Bible, is not as much about our love as it is God's love for you? Now, there's a, a very familiar scripture, and I know you know it, and it talks about God's love. It's John 3.16. Now, what is John 3.16? Come on, everybody. You know, you remember, you know, having these drills, scripture drills, and all that kind of stuff. John 3.16, for God so loved the world... Or did it say, for the world so loved God, it's not about us. Remember? It's about him. But sometimes it seems like we get so consumed with what we're doing that we forget about God. And it seems as though maybe the world so loved God that he gave his only begotten son. That's not true. The Bible says clearly that we did not first love him. He first loved us. And that's interesting, the Greek word for world there. You have to understand, I want you to capture this phrase, for God so loved the world. Two things about that. One, the world, you know what that means in the Greek text? It means a sinful system. A sinful way of life. And it says that God so loved. Now let me ask you a question. What does that mean? <coughs> that God so loved the world. A sinful system. That he gave his one and only son. Have you ever been a so loved person? Have you ever been like God so loved? Have you been like Jesus who so loved everything about us that he gave his own life for us? That have you ever been a parent who so loved your child or so loved a member of your family that you did things for them that you probably wouldn't do for anybody else. Are you a so loved person? That you would not let anything get between you and your love for that person that you so love? How about Jesus? We're talking about him and his unconditional love. For us. You know, I remember a time, and I'm sure you all probably didn't ever get paddled when you were growing up, but I was a little stinker, and uh, I can remember getting paddled once from my stepdad, who I called dad because he was the only one that I really had that cared about me. And he, he uh, disagreed with my mom on some punishment about something that I was definitely guilty for. And uh, mom said, you take that paddle and you go in there and you beat his butt with that thing until he says he's sorry. <laughs> mom did not spoil the rod, okay? <laughs> and spare the child. My dad, however, on the other hand, he didn't agree with the punishment. So you know what he did? He took me in this room. I'll never forget it as long as I live. He took me in this room and I'm mean this with all my heart. He said, when I hit the bed with this paddle, you better yell out. 
<laughs> Every time I hit it, you better yell out even louder. <laughs> and he certainly did that, and I will never forget. I mean, I was clearly guilty. Now, there were other times when he did battle me, and he thought that was the right thing to do. But in this particular time, he so loved me. Have you ever been that way with someone? That you so love them that you look over their faults? That you look over the things that you know? Do you know what that's like? That's like crazy love. Crazy love is a blinded love that you are so consumed, you love that person so much that there's just nothing in the world that could keep you from that person and that love that you have. You know, I'm going to bring up another crazy aspect of this kind of godly, crazy love. This unconditional love that God is so loved. The, the author of this book was inspired by God. His name is John. Well, John did something that no other disciple then or now has probably ever done. He wrote John, you listen to this, the disciple that Jesus loved. Wow. And not only did he do it once, he did it five times. Can you imagine his father God looking down, inspiring John, and allowing him to write this. John, the disciple that God loved. Now, you know what that means? For God to let him do that means that God loved him. And you know in a special way, and you know and I know that the Bible is symbolic. It wasn't just about John. I want you to put your name in there. Ken, Megan, Ellen, Martha, Steve, Gary. God so loved God loved you. You are the disciple. Megan, you're the disciple that God loves. Steve, you're the disciple that God loves. Ellen, you're the disciple that God loves. Martha, you're a disciple. John, the disciple that God loved. It means that God is crazy about us. Like you're crazy about your kids. This kind of crazy love. Five times God let John write that. Put yourself in that same place. John, the disciple that Jesus loved. And I'm going to tell you, that will change your world. If you put your name instead of John, the disciple that Jesus loved. You know, there's a, there's a book called Crazy Love. I don't know if any of y'all have heard of that book or not, but it's by Francis Chan. Now, he's no relation to Jackie. Ooh, you know, that kind of guy. All right, that's just what he does. He, he's a martial artist, an actor. Francis Chan is a psychologist. He's a pastor, he's a book writer, he, he's an author. He writes this about God, he calls God's love. The whole book is about God's crazy love. Listen to what he has to say. God's love is extravagant. It's so love. God so loved. God, he says, doesn't feel love, doesn't do love. God is love. 
He's the personification of love. God can no more deny himself than stop loving you. It is who he is. His love is crazy love. And aren't you glad? Because he didn't think one minute when you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, he didn't say no. He welcomed you like the prodigal son and put the best robe, he put the ring on your finger, and he said, welcome home. That's how crazy God's love is. He doesn't give us what we deserve, he gives us what we need. So this whole invitation to following Jesus is not just about God's love, though. It's also about meaning that God goes before us and we go behind him. John chapter 11, now you've got to listen to this because there's some interesting things going on in this particular scripture. John chapter 11, 7, 11 and 14. Now listen to what Jesus and the disciples were talking about. Then he said to his disciples, when he heard about Lazarus, let us go back to Judea. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. So then he told them plainly, because they were arguing in the middle of this and saying, Jesus, you're going to get killed if you go there, because the last time that you went, you know, in John, the book of John, he's gone three times, and the third time is the charm. And they know if he goes there again, they're going to try to kill him. So we might think that the disciples here are, are having problems with him going because they think Jesus is going to get killed. But there's really something else going on here. Now listen to this. Think about this. There's another scripture that kind of helps us get a clue as to what's going on really behind what the disciples are concerned about in Luke chapter 5 verses 8 through 11. Do you remember when Jesus first called them and uh, he said, Peter, go out in the water and I'm going to fill the boat up with fish. And Peter's like, yeah, right, Lord. I'm a fisherman. I've been out all night. I know these waters. It ain't happening. But when it did, Peter's response was when Simon Peter saw this, listen to what this says. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, something very interesting. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Do you see what is happening here? The disciples are about to go to Jerusalem. Peter, in the beginning, saw something and that, that happened with Jesus, and Jesus was offering him a relationship, and Simon Peter said, Get away from me, Lord. I can't live up to the end of this relationship. I can't hold my end up. I can't be like you. I, I'm a sinful man. Have you ever been that way? That God has asked you to do something and you see some miraculous things and you know what Jesus can do, but then you have to remind yourself, I'm following him. I have to put myself behind him. I have to know that Jesus is going first. Can I get an amen? And if he is, then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what it's all about. Peter and the disciples are worried that when they get to Jerusalem, they won't be able to hold up their end of the relationship. They're supposed to be these super apostles. And they don't think that they can do it. And they're afraid. They're afraid that like Jesus, they're going to be crucified. They're going to be killed. And they're going to have to 
Hold it till the end, and they're not ready for it. Have you ever been that way before? Christ asking you to do something? You know he can do it, but you're not too sure about yourself. And you need some reassurance. Well, I've got good news. You don't have to worry about holding up your end of the relationship. Because that's what the crucifixion and the cross was all about. Listen to 1 John 4.10. Listen to this. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus never meant. Knowing how we are, he made us. Knowing that, knowing that we would not be able to live up our end of the relationship. This is a covenant that he has between us and he won't let us down. He will hold our end up when we don't think we can any longer. You see, that's the difference in what it means to be a Christian. Jesus understands us never expected you to hold to be the manager of your universe. Can I get an amen? You're not to be first. You're to be second. It's an invitation to be second. Adam Hamilton says in his book, The Way, God's love is extravagant. It's extraordinary. Listen to what he says. He won't stop loving you. Did you know? He says, you can try to shake him, you can try to trick him, you can try to do anything possible, and he won't stop loving you. This is the most extravagant, crazy love. Oh, Lord God, what amazing news that you have given us. This invitation to be second. It's because you go before us. And Father, because you do, we can do all things through Christ. Because you hold up our end of the relationship. It's about your love. And it's about putting you first. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us. And we thank you for your words in Matthew 6, that if we would just do this, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things that we are so concerned about will be taken care of. Amen. Now it is our time for our offering. And uh, those of you at home, if you, at this moment, respond to God's word with whatever is in your heart about giving back an offering to him. This is your time. If you haven't given this week to God's church, to Watkins. This is not our journey. This is not about our love for him. It's about his love for us. So I pray that you would look deep in your heart and respond accordingly to give to whatever degree you wish back to him. It all goes to him. It's not about what we do. It's not about us. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, it's about him. If you need to use your app on your phone for Venmo, already um, your ACH has already taken out your gift. The thing is is that now you stop for a moment and you think about what you do in return for God and how you 
respond. So let us pray. O oh Lord, thank you for this opportunity for us to give a portion of what you've given us back to you. Lord, let us look deep in our hearts and let us respond out of the great love that you have for us, the disciples that God loves. We thank you, Lord, for all you've given this church. We thank you for the people and their generosity their generosity is because you first loved us. And so I pray your blessing on this church and upon all those who give today and those who are volunteering. I thank you for those that have made our sanctuary and our worship team look so beautiful. And we pray for all of our soldiers today. We pray for their sacrifices. Now I would like to have a prayer, a pastoral prayer, and we have a lot of people to think about today. So let us uh, keep all of these folks in our prayers today. First of all, we want to give you thanks, God, for all the praises that we have for Yvonne and Cheryl Satterley's dad. And thank you they got to visit him this week and be with him. And thank you that Yvonne and Tom are together for the successful surgery that she has had. We pray your blessing and your healing power be upon them. We continue to lift up Natalina's husband, Rick's father, Mickey, and Joyce, who have been diagnosed with the COVID-19 virus. We pray for them and pray that you would rest your healing hand upon them, release healing power into their bodies. Uplift them and strengthen them. We pray for Lorraine's Carl's son-in-law, Heath Lewis. And we pray, Father, that you would touch his body and take away the COVID-19 virus. We pray you would strengthen him. Pray you would guide the doctors and help them to make the right decisions that they need to make. We know Lorreen is worried about her daughter and granddaughter. Pray, Father, for them. Strengthen them. Help them to know that you are their hope and that they can trust you. Lord, we pray for Tanya, our preschool teacher that is sick with the COVID-19 virus. We pray, Father, give you thanks that she is getting better, but we pray your healing hand would continue to be upon her and strengthen her and her family. Be with them, Lord. Touch them with your love and your presence. We pray for uh, Megan's father, Charles Parton, Pray that you continue to lift him up. Pray that you would strengthen him. And pray, Father, that in these next two weeks, that the infection would be removed from his legs and that he would be able to go home. And then we pray for little Leo, Megan's little boy. We love him and we pray, Lord, that you would uh, help the doctors to make the right decisions they need to make. He's having new seizures. And our heart goes out to him and Megan and Israel. And we pray, Lord, Lord, that you would be with their whole family, Lorraine and Rebecca too. But most of all, that you would be with Leo and Megan and Israel this week. Strengthen them and let them know the church family's praying for them and loves them. And Father, we pray for Pastor Rob and Molly and uh, his dog Cliff, that as he comes, that Lord, you would help prepare the way. You know what you want Rob to do when he gets here. We pray, Lord, you would strengthen him. We pray that you would be with Molly. We pray you would bless them. And we pray that you would protect them. And we pray that as they come, that you would give them um, the direction. And uh, we pray that you would reveal your will to him for this beautiful church. And I thank you, God, for the time that I've been able to serve you here and serve you these 33 years. And I look forward to being with my family and serving you as a volunteer in other ways. In Jesus' name we pray. We pray the prayer 
have taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Martha. <coughs> In the hymnal, it is number 697, as this Memorial Day weekend, we sing America. Happy Memorial.